1 John chapter 2, this is part 31 in our verse-by-verse -verse study in the letter of 1 John. And today's title is called Affirmed in the Truth. Affirmed in the Truth. Let's start reading in verse 18. 1 John chapter 2. Little children, it is the last time. And just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now, Many antichrists have risen up, from which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they were of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out so that it might be revealed that they were not all of us. <clears throat> but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? The one confessing the Son has the, fa uh, has the Father. I'm sorry, I skipped a line. Second part of verse 22. He who denies the Father and the Son is Antichrist. Verse 23. Everyone who denies the Son neither has the Father. The one confessing the Son also has the Father. Therefore, what you heard from the beginning, let it abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you will abide in both the Son and the Father. And this is the promise that He promised us, everlasting life. These things I have written to you concerning those leading you astray, but the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but as His anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and no lie, and as He has taught you, abide in Him. Last time in our series, we looked at verses 17 and 19, 17 through 19. And just to sum that up, we saw a stark contrast between the world, that phrase world was used, the world of unbelievers of all sorts versus those who believe the gospel. And of course, you know, the apostles writing to these that, believe the gospel, the ones that heard it from him from the beginning, as you saw some of the language here of what we just read in our introductory text. We saw that the world's system of lies will not last, but the truth of God's word endures forever. And the Apostle John encourages the readers of this letter that he wrote them to be assured in the gospel and to continue to believe it and says that those that left are not of God, but are of the spirit of Antichrist. I think we had mentioned before that uh, a lot of people come to this book for a bunch of different reasons. Lordship people are real big on this book. And they'll come and they'll turn this thing upside down. They don't look at it in this context. And we've looked at this thing contextually. And we see that the reason why John is writing... And it's nowhere near the same reason these lordshippers are talking about as they go to 1 John. So we're going to pick up in verse 20. <clears throat> but you have an anointing from the Holy One. We'll cut it off right there and look at some of these words. Anointing in the Greek is charisma. It's used three times in the total of the Bible. And it means an ointment, salve, or oil for smearing a special endowment um, of the Holy Spirit. Some versions say unction, ointing, uh, anointing or unction in the text. And it comes from a word that means contact, smear, rub with oil to conse consecrate to an office for service. Now, we, of course, you know, look in the Old Testament, you see you know, anointing with oil. Um, 
different ceremonies were done this way, whether it be religion or the politics of the countries. Oil was put on the heads, and we read of some that oil dripped down the beard and so on. Of course, that was always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And so this word that the anointing comes from, this original word that means contact, smear, rub with oil to consecrate for an office or service, is very much related to the name Christ or Messiah, the anointed one. So this anointing is special. See, it says, now we know that, we know that Christ is the anointed one. We're tied to Christ. We're in him. He, of course, is in us. And this anointing is special, and it is not what the Gnostics were merely claiming. Because they were bragging about their anointing. They, they had this special, secret, mystical, higher knowledge. And they were trying to look down upon these believers and make them feel like they were lacking something. And they didn't have enough or know enough or so on. Let's look at uh, the Gospel of John. We've gone to this text, chapter 6. We've gone to this text several times before. Um, sometimes, of course, you know, we go to text for different reasons. But this is a strong text to kind of re reiterate this point here about the anointing, which is tied to, uh, tied to knowledge and tied to faith and so on. Gifts of God so that the people of God may know who God is. John chapter 6 and verse 45, As it is written in the prophets, in the Old Testament in other words, And they shall all be taught of God. Now, we, we know John chapter 6 is, is rich, very thick with uh, sovereignty of God stuff. 37 is a popular one. 44 is a popular one. This is a popular section here. 65 is a popular one. These very strong sovereign grace sections. They shall all be taught of God. Therefore, everyone who hears and who learns from the Father comes to me. Of course, this is Christ uh, preaching. and he was. This was when he fed the 5,000 and so on. This was that same chapter. So here, Christ is talking about His people coming to Him by faith, but first, there is some information, some truth concerning God, concerning Christ, concerning salvation, concerning who they are, and so on, what the standard is of righteousness, right? All God's people shall be taught of God or by God, and even about God, and here we, hear, here we see some hearing and learning. Of course, we know this is not uh, credited to the natural man because they can't, right? Uh, we just saw that in the previous verse, 44. No man can come to me unless, right? So there's inability there. But here God's people shall be taught of God. Remember, I, it's early on. It might be 20, somewhere, 5, 9... This is the work of God that you believe, right? So all through here, it's man cannot take the credit for anything. The spotlight is on God's sovereignty and salvation of the elect alone. Verse, um, 46, not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. We know that Christ was made manifest in the flesh. That's the only reason we can see his, his, huma <coughs> his humanity. This was part of the problem of these Gnostics, these Docetists, that were rejecting his humanity. <coughs> so Christ has seen the Father in his deity. Christ has the ability to do that because he is deity. He was with the Father from the beginning, right? John 1, uh, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1. <clears throat> 
Truly, truly, I say unto you, verse 47, he who believes on me <coughs> has everlasting life. So, our text talks about everlasting life in in 1 John chapter 2. I think John, the apostle, uses that phrase, I think, more than any other apostle, talking about eternal life, everlasting life, and so on. Those phrases. So there was, there was damage done. We know the fall of man, there was damage done in the fall to the mind of all of humanity. The understanding was darkened, right? In other words, how the sinner perceives, it was, you know, the, the sinner is spiritually deaf, dumb, and blind. It's part of total depravity. Having a defiled conscience on top of it. <clears throat> Now notice the, the second part of this line in back in our text. There's an affirmation here in the next part of the line. And you know all things. Now, let's just be transparent here. We can be pretty sure this is not talking about all God's people having perfect knowledge. We are God's people, all the elect are not omniscient. All the elect collectively are not omniscient. There are things that the elect <clears throat> do not know. They continue to learn, right? That's what growth is. All God's people grow. So this is sort of comparative to those that thought they knew. Because everything they said was a lie. The docetists, the Gnostics, they were talking about this other knowledge. Like, can't you see this guy? He's a phantom. He doesn't have a body. What are you talking about? If he had a body, we couldn't be saved. See you guys later. And they took off. And John's pretty much just kind of implying, these people don't know anything because they believe a lie. Now we know, you can go to 1 Corinthians if you want, chapter 2. Another text that's very familiar. In verse 10, But God has revealed them, these mysteries, God has revealed them to us by His Spirit. What do you know? There's the unction. Right? We have an unction. We have an anointing. For or because the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So, notice that. Things of God. This is information about God. This has to do with doctrine. This is means. Right? So, the Spirit does not just like magically speak in some secret whisper to your mind apart from the scripture. We need to get that idea out of our mind. Right? This is it's not magic. God works through his word, through means. Faith not only comes by hearing, hearing by the word initially, but continually as we grow. So the deep things of God. As soon as you start talking about those things, what's going to be tied to it? Doctrine and theology, words that describe and are distinct, right? The deep things of God. For who among men knows the things of a man except for the spirit of man within him? He has an intellect, a consciousness that fills his his head with knowledge when he's in the world doing things, going about to... Uh, eat and sleep and work and whatever. <clears throat> so also no one knows the things of God except they have the Spirit of God. But we have not received the Spirit of the world. Right? Love not the world or the things of the world. We just talked about it last week. We haven't received the 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 spirit of the world, 
but the Spirit from God, so that, notice, notice, we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. So that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. These things also, we also speak not in words of man's wisdom teaches. Okay, first of all, notice there's words here. And first of all, they say, not, not of these kind of words that oppose, you know, the words of the world, not, not the words of the world, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, which words the Holy Spirit teaches. Words, means, gospel, doctrine, scripture. How? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. And so when we talk about, look, when we say something here about spiritual things with spiritual things, and who knows when you talk to people what they mean. We've, we've mentioned this before. Somebody says, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. And I, and I kind of, you kind of start to enter in, you know, I, I'm not religious either. I don't even like that phrase. It's used in the scripture at least once positively in James. But I always talk about religion uh, with a negative connotation in false religion. But when people say they're not religious, they're spiritual, you never know. You know, give me more. What do you mean? You know, are you talking about the Eastern stuff? Are you talking about you, you're seeing um, invisible things fly around the room? Right? You're having visions? Some people think that. Or they hear things, right? God spoke to me, right? They'll do, and they're not talking about the Scripture either. God spoke to me and said, right? That's what some people mean by comparing spiritual with spiritual. I'll tell you right now, we cannot do that. We can't. We will go off the rails and be deceived. Notice this, verse 14, but nat the natural man, this is the one that is the, the carnal man, the one of the flesh, not born again, not regenerate. The natural man, dead and trespasses and sins, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For one thing, you'd have to have faith to do that. But that's not the reason he says it here. He says because they're foolishness to him. You're not going to receive something that's foolish. And it goes further. This is stronger. Neither can he even know them. Can't even know them. Because why? They're spiritually discerned. Or, or judged, sort of an understanding, right? But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself, the spiritual one, is judged by no one. If you remember this word judges here, he who is spiritual judges all things. And notice it says all things. And I want to tie that back to our text. It says, we know all things. It's not saying that we are omniscient. It's not saying that. It's saying we have a discerning principle that God has put in us. And the Spirit works in us with that truth that's been put in us. And we're given faith to latch on to that truth. And we're not going anywhere. We're abiding in it. <clears throat> right? So the word, the word judges here means to scrutinize, to investigate, to interrogate, to determine, to ask, to question, to discern, and to examine. Um, I think, you know, you could give several earthly examples. Uh, I gave one before. I remember um, a lot of people, when they go this other way, toward Cincinnati Brookfield Road, like toward Ross or Harrison. It's kind of a it's kind of a bad intersection the way it's kind of tilted. It's kind of dangerous. But <clears throat> you pull up and you look and you try to judge or uh, determine or discern if there's a car coming and if there is one coming, how fast is it coming? Because you don't want to pull out if it's like flying. If you think, I don't know, the trajectory of the speed of that car, I might get hit, you know. So you might just wait until it just there's nothing 
and it's all gone before you take off, right? So this is a discerning thing that everybody does in all of life. And so when it comes to, of course, when we talk about judging by the gospel, instead of judging by the law, this is, this is part and parcel of it. Look at that last, last verse there, <clears throat> um, 16. 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who has known the mind of the Lord? In, in what way? It goes on to say that in, in this way, that he may instruct him. Well, nobody. Nobody's known him that way. But God has, here's a cliche, God has given us a piece of his mind, right? We know man by nature. Uh, you know, our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts and so on. But when He regenerates us and He gives us an anointing, an unction, we, are, we start to be taught. We start to learn His ways. Christ is the way, right? So we look at Him and we, we, exe- we discern Him. We, we investigate Him, right? And uh, we grow in Him. And it says, at the end here, it says, but we, believers as opposed to the world, as opposed to the natural man, those that don't have the unction, we have the mind of Christ. Again, this is not talking about we're we're not omniscient. But we have this mind now. What is it? It's a new heart that He's given us that starts us going with with these operational principles of the Spirit in us using... Uh, guiding, leading us in and by and through the Word of God to be guided to learn all truth. Of course, we know it doesn't happen all at once. But, you know, when we compare God's people with the world, they don't know anything, right? We've seen that in a couple different texts here. Let's look at uh, John chapter 4, similar language. In verse 23, Christ talking to this woman here. Verse 23, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, because the Father seeks such to worship Him. Now, of course, we know it's, it's God's the Father's not saying, you know, I just can't find anybody. I'm looking for a few good men, like the Marines, right? No. He makes these people this way. There's, there's none that seeketh after God by nature, right? Romans 3. So He makes us this way. Verse uh, 24, God is a spirit, and they who worship Him must Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, of course, there's a lot there, but just remember that in truth, because it's tied to our, our text in, in uh, 1 John 2. And the woman said unto Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He has come, notice this, He will tell us all things. That kind of sounds familiar concerning us knowing all things. It's coming from this Messiah, the Anointed One, right? The Christ. And um, of course, I kind of gave it away there, but Jesus, He said to her, I am the One speaking to I'm Him. It's me. I'm the Eternal I Am, the One that... Uh, the, I'm the Messiah. Now, here's, here's two Old Testament texts that are kind of connected to the, these reference here. So you can turn if you want. They're just one-liners. Deuteronomy 18.15. Um, the woman could have been uh, referring to, if she knew her Old Testament, um, to this text. The Lord... Thy God will raise up unto you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brethren, one like me. Unto him, capital H, you shall listen. He's going to teach you all things, like that lady said. John said you're going to know all things. 
John said in chapter 4, you're going to all be taught of God. John chapter 6. Right? Isaiah chapter 2, here's another reference, and we'll move on. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of God of Jacob. And He will teach us, notice, He'll teach us His ways. And we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go out the law and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. So there is just more propagation of His ways, His Word, His principles, and so on. Of course, we know in, you don't have to turn there, Ezekiel 36, there's the prophecy of the new heart given. And, um, you know, they're going to be given a new heart, the old one taken out. They're going to learn His ways and walk in His ways, and so on. So it was the, the Gnostic heretics who were claiming this special uh, mystical secret higher knowledge. And uh, John's pretty much, you know, just reminding these people, affirming them in their faith, their God-given faith. John turns it completely around here in, guard, in regards to true knowledge. So think about the strong, how strong the comparison is here. Since John is saying that the knowledge of the Gnostics, the knowledge they have, is what? Antichrist doctrine. And it's, it's of the world. What else did he say about it? He said it's a lie. You know what that means? They don't know anything. <laughs> they know nothing. Right? All right. Back in our uh, verse 21. <clears throat> and he, he gives a reason why he has written. He gives a reason why he has not written. First, <clears throat> I have not written to you because you don't know the truth. But because you know it, you know, he's writing to believers. He, he, again, is just reaffirming, you guys are believers. This gospel that you heard from the beginning from me, abide in it, stick with it. So it's an affirmation that they're believers, they're beloved of God, they're encouraged to love one another and to fellowship in the abiding in the gospel, right? And then it goes on redundantly, and it says, And know that no lie is of the truth. Now, um, that's a big one. You know, I mean, we could beat that to death, and we have. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is an obvious one. This is very hated, that line right, <coughs> that line right there. And know that no lie is of the truth. <clears throat> so it's just another um, another visit to the very basic elementary idea again that the gospel must be true to qualify as the gospel. Because if it's not, you know, if it has a lie in it, it's not the truth and vice versa. <clears throat> so a lie will not or cannot be used by God to set His people free. You shall know the truth, and truth shall set you free. Can or does God use a lie to set His people free? No. Now, I know people hate that, and I don't care. They can't prove me wrong. I mean, we just read the text. This is just one of many. So it's the idea here is His, his, his character in veracity, His truthfulness, His perfection, His holiness... The God who cannot lie is not going to use a lie for His people to be converted. Not, not doing it. I don't care what anybody says. Whoever says that God uses a false gospel to save, they're a fool and you need to run from them. They're a liar. They're a false teacher. <clears throat> he will reveal Himself to his people, he said that he will glorify himself in their hearts. Right? 2 Corinthians uh, 4 6. God, who, you remember the verse? <laughs> Sometimes I step out to try to quote something. I think, okay, I hope I remember this one. The God who caused light to shine out of darkness to shine in our hearts to cause us um, to see the glory. 
of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's pretty close, but that's the idea. He's going to glorify himself in his, in his people's hearts. This brand new heart that he gives them, it's going to come with this truth in it. What a deal. What a package. What a gift. So his character's at stake. He's not going to fake people out. He's not going to give people faith in a false gospel. <clears throat> so, to put this part of the verse under a microscope contextually, of course, is to point out the false gospel of these apostates that left who perverted the person of Christ. That is exactly contextually what it's talking about concerning Christ not having a human body. Now, early on in the series, we mentioned this, and I want to kind of reiterate this, that um, there are plenty of perversions that can create a false gospel, right? We look at um, like Second John, you don't have to turn there, but it's like 7 through 9, somewhere around there. It says, you know, if you, um, it's talking about this heresy. It says, if you hold to this, you don't, you don't have God or the Son. And then it talks about how that if you, um, you know, pat these people on their by, uh, back and promote them in their false religion, you're a partaker in their evil deeds with them. And so we had talked about how that that is not the only doctrine that that can be done with. I mean, think about it. Think about um, like the JWs. They say that Christ is not God, right? Can, can we apply, are we not allowed to apply? That works there. That's applied there. The same truth, the implications of the judgment of that lie, saying that Christ is not God, would mean they don't have the Father or the Son. It's the same thing. So there's, there's more than just this particular heresy. But contextually, we're talking about this particular heresy, denying Christ had a body. <clears throat> so, verse 22, 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Anointed One or the Messiah? He asks that in the form of a question. He answers it in the statement. He's saying that's, that's who one is who does that. So these are called liars. Why? Because of their doctrine. It's because of their doctrine. <clears throat> Look at the second part of uh, verse 22. He who denies the Father and the Son is Antichrist. Pretty clear. He jumps right into his accusation that the apostates that denied the Father and the Son, it relates to the Messiah's body. That's what he's saying. So, there's an obvious note here that the idea or denial here, the denial shows, what does it show? A he, he, he has two things right next to each other, an affirmation and a denial. And he, he has a habit of doing this under, under the inspiration of the Spirit throughout this book. He runs these contrasts and zigzags and stacks up. Positive, negative, positive, negative. Believers, the world, so on. And um, so here, when he, when he talks about denies, these people are in denial of the person of Christ. He's showing the antithesis of the true gospel. In other, in other words, the opposite. He's showing... True gospel, false gospel, side by side. True gospel has the proper teaching of the body of Christ in his person. False gospel, the antithesis, shows this. It's not just merely a distinction. It's further, it's further out than that. It is the, it's the opposite. It's an opposing idea. That's why he calls it a lie. And it's from another spirit. It's not from the Spirit of Christ, it's the Spirit of Antichrist. He will, otherwise, he wouldn't use that word, right? Now, again, I think I've, I've piled on layers of this idea 
that I think commonly today you see a lot of people in so-called Christianity, even if you come closer to our type people, Sovereign Grace Calvinist Reform, and you start pushing back on the lies of Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, Arminianism, conditional salvation, works plus grace, all those conditions. When you push back on those and you say, look, these are lies, and you can't mix grace and works. You can't mix law and gospel. Um, you can't do these things to the person of Christ. You can't add works. You can't, because when you do it, it takes away the sufficiency of his work and so on. When we talk about that, there's so much of a dust up and, and protest. I'm seeing it more and more and more. Of course, you, you meet new people, especially on social media, because it's congested and crowded on social media and people all the time. You mean to tell me? And, and usually they'll associate it with their own experience. I taught Sunday school for 30 years, or my grandma taught Sunday school for 50 years. My did, dad did this, my mom did this. Um, stop. Christ did this, <laughs> okay? Compare yourself to Him. If you add something to it, you're adding a lie. And you're lying on God because you're making His work insufficient. So, of course, you know, this ministry is known for pushing back against against that we get a lot of get a lot of hate mail um, so it's the expression of the denial in the next part of the affirmation of the truth that says the one uh, the second part of verse 23 uh, did we read the first part of 23 everyone who denies yeah the son neither neither has the father you don't have either one so the expression here, denial, is connected to the affirmation here of believers. The one confessing the Son, you got both, the Father and the Son. Simple. Again, side-by-side -side contrast. This is the wisdom of God, and it's helpful that God, through the inspiration of the Spirit, would have John pin it this way. There's no questions about it. Even though we get the pushback from people, they're wrong. Okay, and, and it doesn't mean that we're necessarily right. It means what we believe is true. right? It's not about us. The truth is more important than we are. Verse 24, Therefore, what you, notice, heard from the beginning. Right? This is the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear except, what, John 10, or uh, Romans 10, a preacher. <clears throat> or in other words, the truth being set forth by someone. Therefore, what you heard from the beginning, look, let it abide in you. Don't get away from it. Keep it. Stand firm, <clears throat> stand firm in it. Embrace it. Study it. Grow in it. See the value in it. It's what, it's what God says about Himself. You know, tied to, let me back up a second. You know, tied to these lies that we always see. You know, I'm, I'm just, uh, this week there was a guy. <laughs> I lost my patience this week with a guy, a little bit. It, wasn't, it didn't turn out too bad, but... Hey, when we deal with flat-out works mongers, we know what to expect, and 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 I I see the trajectory of it, and and I you know I don't get too mad because I feel sorry for them. But when we get into these guys that think they're you know scholastic and <clears throat> scholars, and they they dig in um, historic theology, and they talk about classic Calvinism and the Reformed tradition. And they want to they want to go right on the fringes, and they want to find as many people as they can find that taught some form of a universal love that claim to believe to be sovereign grace, and they want to try to 
stretch out that atonement as far as they can to say that you're allowed saying that God loves you and Christ died for you. And there's so many historic doctrines that are tied to that garbage. And that's just what it is. You know, this idea of classic Calvinism is weak and watered down. I don't have anything to do with it. Which is which common grace and well men offer is tied to it. But you've got people that are uh, hypothetical universalists, Amaraldians, and so on. And these guys love to collect these quotes and just push it. And this one boy um, called himself a Reformed Catholic. It was a capital C, because some people use that word, you know, universally. And uh, he was just spewing out. Just, it was crap. And that's what I told him it was. And, uh, but you know, like when you look at Armenian, I mean, you expect that, but when they come and start using your language and dirtying up the water there, these people are more subtle, more deceitful. They should, they should know better. <clears throat> Let it abide in you. <clears throat> The second part of that verse. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you will abide in both the Son and the Father. Verse 25. And this is the promise that He has promised us, everlasting life. Let's go to Titus chapter 1. So think about the character of God. You know, when we talk about, we've missed this before, you cannot divorce God from His Word. You can't divorce what God says in His Word about Himself. You can't divorce doctrine from God. You can't divorce theology from God. None of these things should be separated or divorced. They go together. The God, sometimes we use that phrase, the God of the Bible, right? The God of creation, and so on. So, you know, he's invested his own character into what he says about himself. He has a reputation, and he's, he's a jealous God. He likes to kind of compare and contrast himself against idols that, are, that fail, right? So, just think about the idea of promise. This is what comes out of the mouth of God from the heart of God, the mind of God, in other words. So here's Paul, um, Titus 1.1. Paul, servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God, <coughs> God's elect, in the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Notice this. In hope of eternal life, which God, which one are we talking about? The one that cannot lie. Now, we know there's only one God, and, and the one true God, He cannot lie. So He promised this eternal life before the world began, it says in verse 2. In hope, I didn't look up the original there to see if that word was rendered uh, confident expectation. I would imagine that it is. But in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. Now, who did He promise that to? He didn't promise to any of us. We weren't there before the world began. This is the Father and the Son in the, in the covenant, speaking to one another. As all these things were laid out concerning Christ being surety, representative, substitute, Mediator, advocate. There were promises connected to this. His reputation was on the line for it because he's the God that cannot lie. Quick note uh, it's not that he won't lie, he can't, right? He's impeccable. Verse 3 But in due times, 
concerning this promise that was before time, I said that he didn't promise that to any of us because we weren't there. Um, the Trinity had a covenant, but in due times, what happened? That was made manifest. That was unfolded, unpacked, made known. His word through preaching, which is committed to me, Paul says, according to the commandment of God our Savior. So the the terms of the covenant, the promises, the conditions, the terms, and so on of this covenant or contract or compact before the foundation of the world, the terms of it were preached out, were made manifest in time through the gospel so that we can see and hear them. And we then we know what God was talking about before the foundation of the world, like this is the plan that's going to glorify Him, right? Back in our text, verse 26, 1 John 2, 26. These things I have written to you concerning those leading you astray. So the apostates who left is the reason that John is writing this to these people. <clears throat> he clearly says that. These things have I written to you concerning those leading you astray. The Gnostic Docetists in their, in their lies about Christ didn't have a body and the, all the implications of that. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and no lie, as He has taught you, Abide in Him. Now we're gonna we're gonna leave that verse for next time. And um, I've copied and pasted. I'm out of verses. I think there's two more in that chapter, right? After this one, yeah. So we'll de we'll deal with those three verses next time around. Um, uh, I know Patrick. Um, he had a shift change with his job, and I think next week is the. Um, he'll be here next week, Lord willing. And after that, he's not going to be here for a while. So I had mentioned to him um, that we would do a, a Q and A because we were talking about doing a Q and A sometime between now and the end of the year Q and A. So I thought next week would be a good time to do that. <clears throat> and then after that, more than likely, we will look at these last three verses. Now we have a conference coming up in Lexington, Kentucky, on November. Saturday, the November 4th, and uh, we're not having a meeting here. And uh, Sonny has asked me to preach the next day, Sunday, there also. So everyone's welcome to go there then. Any questions or comments? It almost sounds like a Referring uh, one of the guys was Brandon Craig. The subtlety. You know, when I'm up here and talking about different things in this text, I mean, there's loads and lists of people that oh, I've, yeah. I've dealt with that. Uh, but that came to my mind. Yeah. yeah I know you've been reading his uh, articles lately and whatever. <laughs> um, anything else? <clears throat> All right.